Welcome back on our videos covering the major skeletal muscles of the body. As I promised on the last video, before we are ready to do so, I think that it will be useful for us to review some general rules and conventions which may help you to make sense of all these terms. So there are a few different things that we might learn from the muscle name. Let's look at each of these with some examples. If you have not reviewed the major muscles of the skeletal system yet, do not worry. These muscles will become familiar to you as we study them. So the first thing that we might learn from a muscle's name is its location. Often this is the bone or body region with which the muscle associates with. A good example would be temporalis muscle which is located over the temporal bone of the skull. See, this is where having learned the bones will pay off. Next, another thing that the name of a muscle can tell us is a cue of the shape of it. Muscles have distinctive shapes and often the term can describe these. Let's look at an example. So here we have deltoid muscle. This is the muscle that wraps around covering the shoulder. And actually the term comes from Greek word deltoides, which means a triangle. And if you look at it, it has a triangle kind of shape. Well, the next one that I want to mention to you is the fact that the name of a muscle can give us a cue about the size of a muscle. This is especially true when we have many muscles that are alike and we want to come up with a rule that somehow tells them apart from each other. Let's have a look of a couple of examples. So we can have gluteus maximus. This is the largest muscle of the butt. So your sitting muscle, right? Can you think of anyone with a very well-developed gluteus maximus? Well, if we have maximus for the largest of this muscle group, we will also have medius for the middle sized one and minimus for the smallest one, but that is not shown in this picture. Or we can use a word longus to describe the muscle that is the longest of the lot. And there are many other examples. See what you can find when you review the muscles of the group. Next, let's return to our anterior side of the body and consider muscle names where the name tells us something about the fiber direction of a muscle. So we are looking at the direction of muscle fibers, which are also known as fascicles. So how the fibers run in a muscle? And the example that I have picked here is rectus abdominis muscle. These are the abs that show up on individuals with a low fat percentage under the external layers of the abdominal region. So six pack, or it can be more or less depending on the individual characteristics. So the word rectus means that these muscle fibers run straight. But we can also have transversus. Here transversus abdominis muscles are running in a transverse angle. Or we could have oblique fiber direction, as in the internal and external obliques of the abdominal region. So this is in a weird angle that does not follow any of those of the traditional planes of the body. Remember we reviewed those in our chapter one. So fiber direction can tell us a lot of information of the muscle to just on the name of it. Then I want us to consider the number of origins in a muscle name. So we are looking at how many endings muscle has. And sometimes this is told in the name of this muscle. Let's look at some examples. So the one that I would guess that you think of is of course our biceps. Biceps per key muscle is the more anterior one and responsible for deflection. Where is the beach, if you wish? But more importantly, the term biceps tells us that there are two ends. 
And we can, of course, also look at the triceps. Triceps brachii is responsible for the extension, as the name suggests. It has three ends that we consider here. I hope that that makes sense. Let's move on to the next one. What I mean by learning the attachment points from the muscle name is that the name itself may be formed based on the point of origin or insertion or both or if there are a number of those then all. So these are the locations that the muscle connects to. Let's look at an example. And this is one of my favorite ones. Sternocleidomastoid muscle is the muscle of the neck. And you can sometimes see it very pronounced on an individual that tilts their head like this. So, sternocleidomastoid muscle is named after three points that it attaches to. Let's have a look at that. So, the first, the manubrium of sternum. You remember this from our review of the chest bone, the top part of it. Then it attaches also to the clavicle at the other end. So, our collarbone. And finally, between those two points, it also attaches to the mastoid process of the skull. So, it is attached to these three points that gives this muscle its name. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, let's look at how some muscles are named based on their action. So here we are looking at the action that the muscle produces. And there is a cue of that in the name of a muscle. Let's see this with an example. And the example that I have picked is the flexin digitorum superficialis muscle. And if you will not actually see it on this diagram that I provided with the chapter material as it is more superficial to the muscle shown on it. But I have added it here. And the part of the name that I want us to pay attention here is the flexor part. So this muscle flexes some structures. And in this case the structures acted on our fingers of our digits. We could think of other examples, I'm sure, like flexor carpi radialis in the upper limb or extensor digitorum longus of the lower limb. So there are many examples that you will come across of this. So that is quite a list of things that just the name of a muscle can tell us, isn't it? Well, sometimes we might do what you were beginning to see, the examples of earlier there. We can have a name that is a combination of many of these fa factors. Let's look at one example of this. And the example of this that I have picked here is extensor carpi radialis longus muscle. And this is a muscle of the upper limb, and it is one of the five most important muscles that control the movements at the wrist. It is a long muscle that we cannot actually see here, but that is not important here. I want us to pay attention to its name rather than spotting it on diagram. So let's think what the name tells us. So, its function is to extend, and it runs at wrist, and it follows the radius, bone that we have seen before, and it is long. So that muscle name alone allows us to place it fairly well into its location, and it also tells us about its function, as well as about where it runs at, and we also learn about its size. See how it all comes together. This is all I wanted to discuss about naming skeletal muscles. And we will wrap up this video here. And on the next video, we will briefly look at the muscle fiber direction a little more. I will see you there.